All right. Um, during the next class period, we will start having reports on Hutchinson and Karen will report on chapter four and um, she'll be the only one this coming time, but then we'll have two per uh, session on each Wednesday after that uh, for, what would that be, uh, maybe three more sessions. All right, do, do you have any questions about what we're asking for on the reports from Hutchinson? About maybe 15, 20 minutes? And then we will uh, just have a discussion. I would like for all of you who are not reporting to bring a question. One question that this has raised in your minds and uh, we will uh, discuss it in class. Okay. All right. Last time we were in the middle of this fantastic Christmas quiz. And uh, we will continue it here with number 12. Uh, how many angels spoke to the shepherds? One, three, a multitude, or none of the above? One. What was that? One. 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 I thought there was a multitude of the heavenly host, but you're right, it was one. One spoke to the shepherds, the other, others uh, sang praise to God. Uh, number 13, what sign did the angels tell the shepherds to look for? Uh, a, this way to baby Jesus. B, a star over Bethlehem. C, a baby that does not cry. D, a house with a Christmas tree. E, a baby in a stable. F, none of the above. B, none of the above. B, a star over Bethlehem? None of, the, none of the above. Oh, I'm sorry. None of the above. Okay. You're right. Uh, none of the above. What did the angels sing? Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Alleluia. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Glory to God in the highest, or my sweet Lord. D. D. Uh, which one is that? What words? D. Glory to God in the highest. Okay. Glory to God in the highest. That's right. What is a heavenly host? A. The angel at the gate of heaven. B, the angel who invites people to heaven. C, the angel who serves refreshments in heaven. D, an angel choir. E, an angel army. F, none of the above. Karen said none of the above. Okay, none of the above. Any other opinions here? Any guesses? All right. This is what host means. It is uh, in the Old Testament when uh, the Lord is called the Lord of hosts, it uh, is referring to the armies of God. All right. Uh, there was snow uh, that first Christmas. A, only in Bethlehem. B, all over Israel. C, nowhere in Israel. D, somewhere in Israel. E, Mary and Joseph only dreamed of a white Christmas. Nowhere, nowhere in Israel. Nowhere. Nowhere? Nowhere. Okay. Okay, that's, uh, uh, that's C, nowhere in Israel. Well, uh, it could be D, somewhere in Israel, because Mount Hermon had snow, so, uh, or has snow part of the year. So it's possibly C or possibly D. The baby Jesus cried, A, when the doctor slapped him on his behind, 
B, where the little drummer boy started banging his drum. C, just like other babies cry. D, he never cried. A, not C. C? Hey, some of you are very quiet here. <laughs> but you're right. It is, it is C. Uh, that, that Christmas carol that says, no crying he makes, that is not in scripture. What is frankincense? A, a precious metal. B, a precious fabric. C, a precious perfume. D, an Eastern monster story. E, none of the above. C. C. E? A precious perfume. Precious perfume? And did somebody say B? Or one of the other ones? None of the above. Uh, what's that, Jason? None of the above. Uh, your sound is breaking up. Uh, e. I, I, oh, there you go. E. Okay, the correct answer is E. Uh, frankincense is incense. 19. What is myrrh? An easily shaped metal? A spice used for buying, uh, burying people? Uh, C. A drink? D. Aftershave lotion? E. None of the above. A. A spice used for burying people. B. Yeah. B. B. Okay. Daniel, do, do you really think it's A? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, myrrh is B. A spice mm. used for burying people. 20. How many wise men came to see Jesus? Um, it's not, three. it's three. not, it's not mentioned that it's free. So I'm assuming that it's either one or more than one. <laughs> okay. Uh, you can't go wrong with one or more than one. Uh, scripture Definitely doesn't... not free. Okay. Scripture doesn't say, and a uh, little later on today, we will look at uh, why we say it was three. What does wise men refer to? A, men of the educated class. B, they were Eastern kings. C, they were astrologers. D, they were smart enough to follow the star. E, they were sages. B. B and C, maybe? Yeah, it a. looks like B and C. B and C? Okay. Yeah. Okay. But more lenient to C. <laughs> okay, actually, C is the correct answer. They were astrologers. The wise men found Jesus in a A, manger, B, stable, C, house, D, holiday inn, E, good mood. It could possibly be E, sir. You never know. Oh, well, you it never know. <laughs> well, no crying he makes, right? It must be E. Uh, it must be C, because it's some kind of house. Okay, C is correct. Uh, it talks about the house where they were. The wise men stopped in Jerusalem, A, to inform Herod about Jesus, B, to find out where Jesus was, C, to ask about the star they saw, D, for gas, E, to buy presents for Jesus. B. 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 Okay. Okay. You're right. It is B. Uh, 24. Where do we find the Christmas story in order to check up on all these ridiculous questions? A. Matthew. B. Mark. C. Luke. D. John. E, all of the above, F, only A and B, C, only A and C, H, only A, B and C, I, only X, Y and Z, J, Aesop's Fables. E. 
Which G. one, Daniel? G. G, only A and G. C. Oh, G, okay. Any other uh, answers here? Yeah, G. Okay. Okay, the correct answer is G in Matthew and Luke. When Joseph and Mary found out that Mary was pregnant with Jesus, what happened? A, they got married. B, Joseph wanted to break the engagement. C, Mary left town for three months. D, an angel told them to go to Bethlehem. E, both A and D. F, both B and C. B. 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 B, okay. What do the rest of you think? B. B, okay. Well, the correct answer is F, both B and C. Joseph wanted to break the engagement. That, that is from Matthew. And C, Mary left town for three months. That is from Elizabeth. Okay. 26. Who told Mary and Joseph to go to Bethlehem? A, the angel. B, Mary's mother. C, Herod. D, Caesar Augustus. E, both A and D. F, both B and C. B. A. B. A. B. A. B. A. E. C. 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 <laughs> okay, I've heard A, B, and E. And D. And, and D. Okay. E, yeah. Okay. The correct answer is D. Caesar Augustus, he... He said that a census should be taken of the whole earth. And because of that, uh, they went to Bethlehem. 27. Joseph took the baby Jesus to Egypt. A, to show him the pyramids. B, to teach him the wisdom of the pharaohs. C, to put him in a basket in the reeds by the river. D, <clears throat> because he dreamed about it. E, to be taxed. F, Joseph did not take Jesus to Egypt. G, none of the above. G. E. B, D. Because he dreamed about it. Okay. D and D. I've heard D and G. Okay, the yep. correct answer is D. Uh, it, he was told in a dream that that's what they should do. Okay, 28. The final question. I think that this test was A, super, B, great, C, fantastic, D, all of the above. All of the above, sir. <laughs> all, all. <laughs> all of the above. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you for having a little bit of fun with me. Okay. All right. Um, the date of Jesus' birth. Are, are you getting the screen share? No. No screen share. Okay. Hold on just a second. Yes, I see why. Okay. Okay, do you have it now? Got it now, okay, good. Yes. Okay, hold on while I get my notes here. Okay, uh, the date of Jesus' birth. When was Jesus born? 
The exact date of Jesus' birth, as with most events in the New Testament, uh, we don't know. Now, let's just look, first of all, at the terminology that we use to mark the years um, with the designations of B.C., uh, before Christ, and A.D., Anno Domini, uh, meaning year of our Lord. Uh, recently, some have changed the terminology uh, from B.C. to B.C.E., before the Common Era, and from A.D. to C.E., meaning Common Era. Uh, I think this is an attempt to be politically correct for those who are not Christians, um, not to be offensive to them, uh, but I'm going to use B.C. and A.D., uh, after all, it's Jesus' birth that our calendars are uh, based on. And if we don't say that, then we're, I don't think, being uh, upfront. So um, I'm going to use B.C. and A.D. Now, you would expect Jesus to have been born at the year zero, right? Uh, after all, we're measuring it all from his birth. Um, and that one year bef before that would be year minus one, and the year after that would be year one. But in fact, Jesus was born B.C., before the year zero. Actually, there is no year zero. It goes from one B.C. to one A.D., Our present uh, reckoning here was invented by a monk in Rome by the name of Dionysius Exiguus, who lived from 470 to 544 AD. Uh, and eventually this became the, the standard reckoning uh, of the Western world. Uh, the problem is that he was a few years off. We know that Jesus was born before the death of Herod the Great, which took place sometime between March 12th and April 11th of 4 BC. But how long before Herod's death was Jesus born? Matthew tells us in Matthew 2.16 that Herod put to death all the boys in Bethlehem who were two years old or younger. He inquired of the Magi exactly when the star appeared. Therefore, Jesus could have been. Uh, uh, it, therefore, Jesus could have been born uh, up to two years. To, sorry about the sentence. Therefore, Jesus could have been up to two years old when the Magi visited him. That would push the date back to six B.C. In Luke uh, 2, 1 and 2, it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Now, it's been difficult to fit the census into uh, what is known about Quirinius' uh, reign in Syria, uh, because he was in office later than this. Um, and there are different ways of looking at it, ways of trying to figure it out. It could possibly be fit into the year around 4 BC. Stephen Young says that the best answer to the seeming discrepancy is to say that the dates are approximations. Daryl Bach, in his commentary on Luke, uh, gives many different possibilities of interpretation. The bottom line is that while several of these interpretations are possibilities, we're not sure which one of them may be correct. We can probably say that Jesus was born around 7 to 4 BC, somewhere in that time frame. Now, what day of the year was Jesus born on? Again, we don't know. 
the early church doesn't seem to have much of an interest uh, in uh, that kind of thing. Around AD 200, Clement of Alexandria mentioned May 20th and April 21st as dates that were being talked about, but he makes no mention of December 25th. By the fourth century, two dates uh, were recognized. December 25th in the West and January 6th in the East. Most Christians came to celebrate uh, December 25th an Epiphany, uh, the, the time of, of presentation of Jesus in the temple, was celebrated on January the 6th. Uh, in the church calendar, the Christmas season goes from December 25th to January 6th, those 12 days. So these are the 12 days of Christmas. Uh, are you all familiar with this, the song, the 12, uh, the 12 days of Christmas? Okay, if you are, raise your hand. Let me see. Okay, okay. Um, in America, it is sung, you know, every Christmas. Every Christmas you'll hear it. And a lot of people don't know what these 12 days of Christmas are, you know. I just thought Christmas was one day. Well, it's talking about the Christmas season that goes from December 25th to January 6th. So why do we celebrate on December 25th. Many say that it was the day of a pagan celebration of the unconquered sun established by Emperor Aurelian in AD 274. The problem is that there is no early evidence that that was true. It wasn't until the 12th century that this was suggested. When the Christians first started celebrating December 25th, it was not at a time when they were borrowing practices uh, from, uh, from the pagans. Another theory is that Jesus' conception was on the same day of the year as his crucifixion, which by Tertullian's calculation was March 25th, so nine months after that would be December 25th. Augustine also mentions this. Uh, so it may not be true that December 25th was taken from a uh, pagan festival. But again, the, 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 the answer to that question is, what day was Jesus born on? Uh, we're not sure. We just don't know. Now, let's, uh, well, first of all, do you have any questions or comments here so far? Okay. Let's look at Jesus' birth in Matthew. The infancy narrative in Matthew tells of Jesus' birth and childhood from Joseph's viewpoint. Uh, we so showed you this picture the other day when we looked at the uh, geographic background. This is what Bethlehem looks like today. Jesus' birth was in Bethlehem. Uh, Bethlehem was a small town uh, about eight kilometers away from Jerusalem. It is probably significant that Jesus was born here and not in the capital, uh, capital city of Jerusalem. Of course, it was a fulfillment of prophecy, Micah 5.2. When Joseph, Mary, and Jesus return to Israel, they go to live in Nazareth. And uh, here is that picture of Nazareth uh, that I showed you the other day. Now, the infancy narratives in Matthew are not an, an afterthought, uh, something tacked on to the beginning. Rather, they are an integral part of the gospel. Matthew's infancy narrative has been outlined this way. Uh, we first of all have the introduction from 1, 1 to 17, which is the genealogy. We have scene 1, 1, 18 to 25, 
And the Old Testament reference that Matthew gives for this is Isaiah 7.14, a virgin shall conceive. And there we have the first dream of Joseph. In scene two, it goes from 2.1 to 12, and it is a fulfillment of Micah 5.2 uh, about Bethlehem. And uh, here we have Herod, the Magi, and Bethlehem. In scene three, it's 2.13 to 15, and it, uh, the Old Testament text here is Hosea 11.1, 1, out of Egypt I have called my son. And here is the second dream of Joseph. Scene four is 2.16 to 18. Here the text is Jeremiah 31, uh, 15, um, Rachel weeping for her children. And it is Herod, children, and Bethlehem. And then scene five, 2.19 to 23. Uh, the text there is unknown and it is the third dream of Joseph. Now here is Raymond Brown's outline. In 1, 1 to 17, we have the who of Jesus' identity. The genealogy shows him to be the son of Abraham and the son of David. Uh, this genealogy actually has three sections of 14 people each, going back to Abraham. Uh, the fact that there are four foreign women that appear in this genealogy uh, may give us a hint that God is going to do something surprising in the life of another woman. Um, it's very interesting that uh, Matthew puts in these four women um, whose pedigree is not very good, and they do some things, some of them, that uh, would not be recommended, and yet Matthew chooses to include them. Of all the women he could have included, he chose those four, and perhaps there is something important about the fact that they are foreign. The Magi come from a foreign country. At the end of the book, we are told to go into all the world and preach the gospel throughout the world. And um, I, I just find it interesting. Let me just go through uh, these other ones here very briefly. In 118 to 25, we have the how of Jesus' identity. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. So Mary, who was espoused or engaged to Joseph, is found to be pregnant. An engagement was much more binding in those days than it is today, and it could be broken only by a divorce. Of course, Joseph assumed that Mary had been unfaithful to him and was gonna divorce her. But an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him not to divorce her because the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And the angel said that Mary would name the son Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. So Joseph took Mary home with him. At this point, the official wedding ceremony had not happened and they remained as virgins until Jesus was born. The where uh, of Jesus' birth is at Bethlehem. Matthew doesn't give us any of the account of going from Nazareth to Bethlehem uh, because of needing to register for the census. He just tells us that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. If, we're not, if it were not for Luke's account, we might think that Mary and Joseph lived in Bethlehem all along. Okay, uh, let us pause here. We'll take a 10 minute break and we will come back after 10 minutes. Go 
All right, who were the Magi? Um, do you all know the Christmas carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are? Bearing gifts, we traverse afar. How many of you are familiar with that Christmas carol? Nobody? It must be American. <laughs> um, that is a, that, that's a Christmas carol that in America you hear every year. And uh, we've sung it ever since I can remember. Um, typically, these men are called wise men uh, because that's the way it's translated in the King James Version. Uh, this, but scripture doesn't call them kings or wise. And it doesn't say that there were three. Uh, a medieval monk named the Magi Melchior, Gaspar, and Balthasar. Some say they represent the three sons of Noah, and others say they represent the three continents of Africa, Asia, and Europe. There is a shrine in Cologne, Germany, that claims to have the graves of the three Magi. The term Magi comes from the Greek word magos, a Persian loan word which Bauer defines as wise man and priest, who was expert in astrology, interpretation of dreams and various other occult arts. And the second meaning is magician. Where were they from? Uh, the Bible says from the East. Some say Persia, some Babylon, some Arabia, and we can't be sure. Frankincense and myrrh would come from Arabia. So here are two possible routes, Thea or Persia, in that area, the north, and uh, the other coming from the bottom, down where it says Yemen, through um, back up to uh, Palestine, up that way. Uh, those are possible routes. We don't know for sure uh, where they were from. Wherever they were from, they would have entered Jerusalem from the east, coming over uh, the Jordan River east of Jerusalem. So in that sense, uh, they were from the east because they entered Jerusalem from the east side. The important thing for us to realize is that they are Gentiles who worship Jesus, the King of the Jews. At the end of Matthew, Jesus gives the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. So these two passages serve as bookends at the beginning and end of Matthew, showing God's concern for Gentiles. Uh, excuse me just a minute. I need to check and see if, I'm, if I've got electricity here. And I don't. So let me just check that out. Recording it? Yeah. Um, Can we make sure everything is plugged in? Looks like it is. Can we just plug the arrow down the other one? Oh. Uh -huh. Let me check it. Okay, I'm in now. The joys of technology. All right. Okay. Um, the whence of Jesus' identity, Egypt and Nazareth. Uh, is again from Brown. Here we have the stories of the slaying of the boys in Jerusalem, in, in Bethlehem, the flight into Egypt, and the return to Palestine, specifically Nazareth. Uh, the account of the slaying of the boys, two years age uh, and under, by Herod, agrees with everything that we know about Herod. He was willing to kill his own family members. 
how much more children that he had never met. And Matthew sees this as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah 31, 15. In response to the warning of the angel, Joseph took Mary and Jesus to Egypt. We're not told where exactly in Egypt they went, but they probably, it probably would have taken at least a month to get there. Um, he might have gone. That would probably be the route that he would take from Bethlehem uh, down to Egypt. While they were in Egypt, Herod the Great died, so that it was then safe for them to return back to Israel. Joseph heard that Archelaus was ruling Judea. Archelaus was a ruthful, uh, ruthless uh, ruler, and Joseph was afraid to go there. So he went to Galilee, which was under Herod Antipas. Specifically, he went to Nazareth. Why Nazareth? Well, Luke tells us that Mary and Joseph were from Nazareth. Uh, but were there any other reasons why Joseph may have chosen Nazareth? Nazareth was a very small uh, village at that time. Uh, it's not even listed in any documents until well after the time of Christ, uh, other than scripture. Um, at that time, Herod Antipas was building the city of Sepphoris, which was only 6.4 kilometers from Nazareth. And uh, the last time we went to Israel, Dickie and I went to Sepphoris, a, a city on the hill. And some people have said that uh, when Jesus talked about a city on the hill cannot be hidden, that he was talking about Sepphoris or thinking in those terms. Uh, Joseph was a craftsman, so he would be assured of steady work in Nazareth. So it could be, it could have been for economic reasons as well as uh, being the traditional home site. Uh, we see in Matthew the account of Jesus' uh, uh, birth the theme of the fulfillment of scripture that, that uh, appears throughout the gospel. So in Matthew, this happened that the, the uh, saying might be fulfilled. And we see that down all through the book, including the um, birth narrative here in, in Matthew. Do you have any questions or comments here? Okay, all right. Jesus' birth in Luke. Uh, the infancy narrative in Luke tells about the birth and childhood of Jesus from Mary's standpoint. And this is Brown's outline of uh, Luke's infancy narrative. There are two enunciations of conception and then two narratives of birth, circumcision, naming, and future greatness. So under two uh, annunciations of conception, we have the uh, annunciation of John the Baptist, plus Elizabeth's pregnancy and praise to God. Then we have the annunciation about Jesus, plus Elizabeth's praise of Mary's pregnancy. Under the two narratives here, we have the narrative about John the Baptist, plus a growth statement transitional to his ministry. And then we have the narrative about Jesus, plus a growth statement transitional to his ministry. So Luke tells us not only about the birth of Jesus, but also that of John the Baptist. In Luke's account, we have some beautiful songs by Mary, Zechariah, and the angels. Uh, just real gems of, of uh, uh, poetry. As with Matthew, the Old Testament themes come through in Luke's account. Themes of freedom, redemption, and salvation. In Matthew, the angel appears to Joseph. 
in Luke, he appears to Mary. And the angel tells here that she will bear a son and that she will name him Jesus. And even though the word Messiah is not used, the angel said that Jesus would, would fulfill that role. Um, Mary asked how this could happen since she was a virgin, and the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even after the miraculous conception, Mary is still a virgin. Pagan religions had stories about divine births, but it was through intercourse between the gods and the virgin. Not so with Mary's conception. Mary remained a virgin until after the birth of Jesus. The journey to Jerusalem. Here we see that Joseph and Mary traveled from Nazareth in Galilee to Bethlehem in Judea. Now there were two routes that could be taken. One was to go eastward from Nazareth to the Jordan River, down to Jericho, up the mountain to Jerusalem, and then on to Bethlehem, a distance of about 145 kilometers. The other route would be to go directly south through Samaria, a journey of about 70 miles or 113 kilometers. Even though Jews didn't like to take this route, I think it was more probable uh, that Mary and Joseph went through Samaria. The trip up to Jerusalem from Jericho would be difficult for anybody to make. Uh, especially a woman who was nine months pregnant. Now, the pictures that we see of Joseph and Mary making this trip show Mary on a donkey and Jesus, Jesus walking. Uh, we had this in the quiz, if you'll remember. Joseph and Joseph walking. But it's improbable that Mary rode a donkey. Donkeys were expensive and probably something that Joseph couldn't afford. Now, Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth, Mary's relatives, we are told lived in the hill country of Judea, which is where Bethlehem was. Uh, so it is possible that in Bethlehem, we are not far from where Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth lived. Did Mary and Joseph have to travel to Bethlehem? Uh, there are those who say that if a census was taken, people would not have been made to go back to their ancestral, ancestral city. But there is actual a, a, an actual decree that we have from Egypt ordering people to return to their ancestral city for a census. Uh, it says Gaius Vibius Maximus, prefect of Egypt orders, seeing that the time has come for the house to house census, it is necessary to compel all those who for any cause whatsoever are residing outside their districts to return to their own homes so that they may both carry out the regular order of the census and may also diligently attend to the cultivation of their allotments. So it does seem that there is a precedent for people going back to their hometowns uh, for a census. Were Mary and Joseph married when they went to Bethlehem? The NIV says in Luke 2, 5, he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, here it appears that they were engaged rather than married. Uh, the Greek word mnestuo 
which normally means uh, is used, which normally means to betroth. However, Luke was probably using the word to signify that the marriage has, had not yet been consummated sexually. According to Barclay, there were three stages uh, to marriage in the Second Temple era. One was engagement. Often this was entered into when they were children through the parents. Uh, marriage was much like a business deal, far too serious to be left to people who were in love. This engagement could be broken off, however, if it was found unsatisfactory. So the first step is engagement. The next step we'll call betrothal. At that time, the, uh, at the time the engagement was ratified, uh, or this betrothal, it could only be broken by divorce. They were not yet living together as man and wife, but they were pledged to each other in such a way that only a divorce could secure their legal separation. And then the third stage is, of course, marriage itself. Nolan says, in Jewish tradition, a girl was normally betrothed in the 13th year, and for legal but not domestic purposes, was from that point on considered to be married. Around a year later, the girl was taken to the bridegroom's home for normal uh, married life to begin. Sexual relations prior to this taking home would be considered a violation of marriage customs. So betrothal was the last st stage of courtship and the couple had most of the legal rights of marriage except for intercourse. When Joseph took um, Mary to Bethlehem, she was a virgin and they were in the last stage of uniting in marriage. So when we ask, were they married or not? Well, it's sort of complicated. If we go by Western standards, um, uh, that's hard to answer because we don't have those uh, three different stages. Why did Joseph take Mary on that long trip to Bethlehem? We can only speculate. Perhaps he didn't want to leave her in Nazareth where she would be ridiculed as promiscuous. Perhaps she was legally required to go to Bethlehem. Uh, we, we just don't know. Any questions or comments here? So uh, I want to ask one question yes, regarding, like I heard like uh, many years ago, like when I was quite young, we were having some kind of like youth discussion with uh, one of the pastors and he said like, uh, because Isaiah prophesies like the virgin will, a virgin will give birth. So many women in those days, like they used to uh, keep themselves like holy or something that kind of practice was there. So is it true, sir? Like, Well, uh, sexual relations would come after the marriage was complete. It wouldn't come in engagement or betrothal. So uh, in that sense, if you consider that being holy, um, yes. Uh, you know that passage in uh, Isaiah, a virgin shall conceive, uh, that word there can, can mean also a, uh, a young lady. And when the RSV came out and translated that, uh, translated it that way in Isaiah, that was, um, uh, there was a storm of controversy about it because they were said, said they were attacking the virgin birth. Um, but it clearly, of course, from the New Testament, it, it was a virgin, virgin birth. And, um, but, For a Jewish young lady, sexual intercourse would come 
after the marriage was completed, not before that. I don't does that answer your question? Uh, yes, sir. Also, like uh, the pastor mentions, like because Isaiah prophesies, so it's kind of like mm -hmm. cultural thing, like the many women in those times, like they try to keep themselves like holy so that they can be the virgin mother, like which Isaiah prophesies, like that can be fulfilled in their life. So something like that he mentioned, like, so that became a little bit kind of like practice among the women, like uh, just, uh, just to be the mother of the coming Messiah, like that. But God chose Mary, so that's what uh, he bring to the focus later. Okay, I have not heard that. Um, and I would be interested in knowing his source for that. That would be an interesting thing to, uh, to research. Yeah. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Uh, any other questions, comments? Sure. Yeah. I think with what uh, Karen was saying, I kind of like heard it before too. Um, I think and this is why, like, remember one of the say, the women came up to Jesus and said, uh, "Blessed is the mother that um, we like that that you that bore you and um, you know in the bosom that you." feed milk, something like that. I think right. I've got one of the gospel has that too. So right. it was kind of like it was all the women, this is something I heard too, all the women were, were, were hoping that they would be this person, this woman that, uh, that would bore the Messiah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't know that that verse is actually evidence of a widespread movement of women desiring to be the mother of the Messiah, uh, perhaps. Uh, again, I would like to see that research. I have not read that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? All right. Uh, Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem. Now, generally, we think that the story goes like this. Mary and Joseph travel to Bethlehem while Mary is nine months pregnant. They arrive in Bethlehem and try to find accommodations, uh, but every inn is full. So they go to a stable or a cave, and on the night that they arrive, Mary gives birth. They lay Jesus in a manger, a feeding trough, in the stable. Now, this is the way that it reads in Luke 2, 4 to 7. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. Luke tells us that Mary and Joseph laid Jesus in a manger. Now, a manger was a feeding trough for animals. What did the manger look like? Uh, we often think of it being made of wood, but very possibly, it looked like this. Uh, this is a manger uh, in Megiddo. It's a feeding trough uh, there made of stone, uh, extremely heavy and not movable. But we're going to look at maybe some other possibilities for the manger here. Kenneth E. Bailey, in his book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, proposes a different scenario. He suggests that since Bethlehem was Joseph's hometown, and especially since he was of royal descent, he would have been welcomed into any home in Bethlehem. Furthermore, a woman who is about to give birth is given special attention and care in any culture. Bethlehem would not have been an exception. On top of that, Mary had relatives nearby. 
Zechariah and Elizabeth lived in the hill country of Judea, which is where Bethlehem was. And the text doesn't say that Mary gave birth on the night that they arrived in Bethlehem. In verse 6, it says, while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And it implies that they were there for a period of time before Jesus was born. Bailey says that we get the idea that Jesus was born on the night that Joseph and Mary arrived in Bethlehem, that this comes from a book written around the year 200 called the Prot Evangelium of James. It gives all kinds of imaginative information, and this was some of it. So Bailey urges us to go back to the actual text rather than the tradition that has arisen over the centuries. Do we have tradition? Well, yes. Think of the quiz. That shows a lot of our tradition. He says that the typical home at that time had a guest room and one other room uh, that was where the family lived. At the end of the room, there was a lower area or an area that was blocked off by boards where the farm animals were brought in to spend the night. That way, the animals would be warm at night and couldn't be stolen. And here is the way that he illustrates it. So uh, this is the main living area of the house. Uh, you'll see a lower area there. You see steps going up. And uh, that is where the animals would stay. And here is another illustration of the house. This is the family living room, it's a larger area. There were mangers there. Notice the mangers, they are dug out areas in the lower part of the family room. The floor was gently sloped so that it could be easily cleaned. Bailey believes that Jesus was born in an ordinary home like this. Now it says that there was no room in the inn, right? The word for inn is kataluma, which means a lodging place. It could refer to an inn, an inn, or to a guest room. This is the word that Jesus uses when he asks his disciples to, pre to prepare a room for the Lord's Supper. Did they meet in a hotel? No. In fact, Jesus defines it in Luke 22, 10 to 12. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room, the kataluma, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. So the, the kataluma was an upper guest room in a home. When Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, he said that the Samaritan took the wounded man to an inn. The word there uh, in Luke 10, 34 is the word pandokeon, which is the normal word for inn. It is not kataluma that we have here in this passage. Here the NIV translates this verse as she wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for him. So according to Bailey, Mary and Joseph stayed in the family room of the home because the guest room was already full. So again, this is Bailey's illustration. And you'll see on the right-hand side of the guest room the Kitalama. Uh, there were people already there, so there was no room for them in the guest room, 
And so they stayed here uh, near the animals uh, where the mangers were and Mary gave birth there. Now that's, that's, that's Bailey's take on this. Here is a first century house and you will see uh, in the lower area, an area where the animals are. And in the upper area would be the, uh, uh, either the living quarters or the guest room up there. So Bailey summarizes it like this. To summarize, a part of what Luke tells us about the birth of Jesus is that the Holy Family traveled to Bethlehem where they were received into a private home. The child was born, wrapped, and literally put to bed on a clino in the living room in the manger that was either built into the floor or made of wood and moved into the family living space. Why weren't they invited into the family guest room, the reader might naturally ask? The answer is that the guest room was already occupied by other guests. The host family graciously accepted Mary and Joseph into the family room of their house. So we need to ask the question, is Bailey right in his assessment? Uh, I think he probably is, but we need to consider that there is an early and strong tradition that Jesus was born in a cave in Bethlehem. Okay? Okay. What do you think about this? Let, let, let me just get your response. Um, how many of you um, have conceptualized what I described earlier? That Mary and Joseph came into the town, it was full, all of the hotels were filled, and they could not get into a hotel, and so they did what they could. They, uh, they went to a stable or to a cave, uh, a cave where animals would have been kept, and uh, Mary gave birth there. They put Jesus in the manger. Uh, how many of you have had more or less that concept of what it was like? Can I see your hand if, if that was what you, what you more or less thought? Nobody? Okay, then I, I would like to know what you did think. How did you sir, conceive think, of it? Yes, sir, so. yeah. I think it's, uh, like you said, sir, we also have similar thinking, but uh, slightly different, like how we understood is like uh, G, uh, Joseph and Mary, they went to Bethlehem and then they look for the guest house, which is very common in Nepalese culture. Like when guests come, they don't have to pay, they can stay for free. Mm -hmm. So, so in that uh, uh, time also like we have that kind of thinking like just like a guest visits the house so they also visited to different people's house so and they did not find any place to stay so that was the only reason like why they have to end up in a stable or like uh, like the place where people used to keep their sheep and cows so yes sir okay good thank you for sharing that uh, what about the rest of you Yes, I thought uh, uh, Jesus and his family members, uh, Joseph and Maria, was uh, uh, dis disgraced by people before, because in Korean con concept culture is the stable and what is the manger? Manger is outside of our main house. Uh -huh. So we we thought uh, they were uh, they they were not they were not invited to inside they're just outside so we thought oh they are disgraced they, they are not welcomed but then I see this oh uh, they were welcomed just there is no guest room the family uh, the owner of the house is welcomed. Uh, they let they let uh, Jesus and parents use the, their own uh, this, uh, living room. So when I see this, oh, they are welcome. Then 
yes. Okay. In our culture, oh, the family members are really um, disgraced or denied by people because the stable and the manger is really outside from our house. Okay. But uh, when I did these uh, pictures, oh, they are welcome. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing, Masha. Thank you. Uh, Daniel or Peter, uh, could you share? One of you. Uh -huh. No, I, I didn't share, share it, but um, I was going to say that, like, this story here, it's, it's very easy to kind of, like, um, interpret from your own culture. Right. In your context. Right. And, um, and of course, for, for us, someone, we're thinking, like, uh, where the animals are kept is probably outside, like what uh, Marsha was saying. And uh -huh. that's where he was taken. Um, funny enough, um, I was so glad when I saw you share about this bit here, because I, I taught um, Life of Christ before I came to PTS. And I was teaching about this because I read it from a book about Cataluma. And I was telling this, like, and, and, and it kind of like changed my perspective when I saw the same, the same picture that you okay. shared. So okay. Funny enough, so then I understood that it's not I mean, there was only a little bit. I mean, I'm, I'm learning so much now coming to ABTS. I was only maybe one percent of it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Any others? Uh, either Daniel or Jason. Yes, yeah, so my my understanding before uh, I can't remember what class it was, but I think uh, my understanding was yeah, it was like you know, the stable, it's kind of like a barn or something that they found and that they went uh -huh. in, but then. I can't remember what class it was. I think that I understood that, you know, the stable was something that, in one of the rooms, I think in their culture, they used to keep their animals and stuff. And so they had no space in the house, but they welcomed them if they wanted to use that, you know, okay. that, that room with the animals and that's what they looking for. Okay, great, great. Sure, uh, um, so it's Peter here. I've yeah. got to solve the cases to find the family that, um, Mary and Joseph went and asked them the question. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, well, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, Jason, what about your concept of this in China? Um, uh, ours is the same as Kieran's, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, there is a book entitled Miss understanding scripture through western eyes i think that's the title of it and um it, it's written to westerners like me who allow our culture to make us misinterpret parts of scripture and uh craig keener in his book spirit hermeneutics says that we we need to understand the scriptures from different perspectives um, because other people's cultures may be more like the culture that Jesus was in than our culture. So if they can bring different perspectives, it can bring us closer to the truth and uh, we can help each other understand. Oh, Dickie just brought a, a copy of the cover. Misreading scripture with Western eyes. It says removing cultural blunders, uh, no, uh, blinders to better understand the Bible. So it's, uh, it's interesting as we look at uh, a passage like this and we can bring our, um, our knowledge and our, our uh, understanding to bear and share with one another and help, help each other understand better those cultural aspects uh, of scripture. All right. Sir, one more thing. Uh, I would like to add one more thing, sir. The picture okay. which you showed, uh, the last picture which you showed to us, still in Nepal, like when you go to the mountains, you can find the house style exactly the same. Like at the bottom is the place for the cows and sheep and goats and upper uh -huh. stairs like same like at the bottom is like uh, where they do their animal like the farming and then above okay. is like house but when you go to the eastern part of Nepal like more towards the eastern then 
our like the house style like in the mountains is what Masha said like it's a little bit outside of the house okay. but not too far near the house sir okay you know to a to an American having animals in the house is really strange yeah it just it just doesn't happen uh, when I pastored in Springfield Missouri uh, somebody built a large building, right, not too far from the church. And I was curious as, as to what it was. And so one day I went up and knocked on the door and I said, you know, what's going on here? And it was a family, it was a home, they lived there, but they had horses. And a large part of that building was where the horses were. Those horses lived in luxury. You know, the gates there had brass uh, hinges and, and all. And it was just pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, I had never seen anything like that before. But it, it sounds like for some of you that that isn't all that uncommon to have animals and people in the same place. All right. Uh, the birth of Jesus was followed by three ceremonies. And uh, this is according to Stein. Uh, the first was Jesus' circumcision on the eighth day. And this was required by the law of Moses and was probably done in Bethlehem. He was also at this time given the name Yeshua or Joshua or as we know it, Jesus. The second was Mary's purification in the temple 33 days after Jesus' circumcision. According to the law, if a woman bore a son, she would be unclean for seven days. She would then go to the temple after 33 days and offer a year old lamb and a pigeon or dove for her purification. And then the third, was the presentation of Jesus to the Lord at the uh, same time as Mary's purification. Again, this was required by the law of Moses for firstborn sons. This also was done in the temple and required a payment of five shekels of silver. You know, it's also possible uh, that instead of redeeming Jesus, which is what that ceremony was, that they consecrated Jesus to God's service, the way Hannah did uh, for Samuel. And in that case, they would not have made the payment. So it could be that they were doing a dedication of Jesus for service to the Lord. While they were in the temple, they met two people who discerned the identity of the child. The first was Simeon. The Holy Spirit had shown him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. Then he took Jesus in his arms and prophesied, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, so uh, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles <clears throat> and the glory of your people, Israel. Then he said of Mary, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. The other person uh, that identified Jesus was an elderly, devout prophetess named Anna. She also spoke of Jesus as the one promised by God to come and redeem Israel. And then Mary and Joseph returned to Galilee. Okay, do you have any questions or comments here? All right, let's look at the genealogy of Jesus. 
uh, when, uh, yeah, <laughs> can yes. I have Marcia? yeah uh, uh, the about the dedication of a child mm -hmm. uh, in the Philippines many people want to have a ceremony for dedication mm -hmm. but um, actually I don't know how can I treat the ceremony as Christian uh, do they do that in Korea uh, not uh, not many <laughs> cases. Okay. Some churches do, some church does not do. So this dedication is looks like um, it is related with the salvation or just to our uh, parents wish it to offer yeah, their babies God? It's not related to salvation. Um, it doesn't save the child. And um, it doesn't baptize the child either, but it is a way of the parents giving the child to God for his service and okay. saying, we are going to raise this child mm -hmm. as a Christian. Uh, um, so so yeah. that, that is parents' wish. Yes. Yes. Okay. Now, in, did, uh, mm. in America... And this is probably where the uh, Filipinos got this, probably from, from the Americans. Uh, in America, it's generally done. Uh, Christian parents normally dedicate their child to the Lord. And it'll happen in a Sunday morning uh, church service. It's uh, normally a short ceremony. And um, the uh, the pastor you know prays and uh dedicates this uh, child to the lord uh, now normally uh, he will also ask the parents do you pledge that you will raise this child in the nurture and admonition of the lord and sometimes he asks the whole church will you do what you can do so that this child at an early age will want to accept Christ as his savior. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't save the child uh, in that sense, but it's a way of the parents saying, we want to give our child to the Lord and we, we want it to do it publicly. Mm -hmm. and, Thank you. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? So just to add on to um, what Marshall was saying, um, so this is one of those um, things from the law of Moses, and and the reason that why that we're practicing it because um, like what we we did like anything that they um, if they repeat it in the New Testament, then maybe it is applicable to us today. Well, I I don't think it's actually from the law of Moses. Uh, it's it's rather I'm talking about dedication now. Uh, it's more in the pattern of uh, Hannah dedicating Samuel to the Lord. So um, you know when a family dedicates their their child, uh, it's not like Samuel who went to live in the temple. Um, well, it wasn't the temple then, but. Um, so it's not to that extent, but it's just a way of saying we, uh, this child is a gift from God. And now we are going to give this child back to God to be used for his work uh, in any way that he would like. Sir, uh, uh, in our country, in our churches, like I have also observed many dedications so just like you said, uh, like the American practices inside the church, mm -hmm. it's safe. Uh, one thing like what we also understood is like the moment we dedicate our child, like the moment we dedicate our children into the presence of God, then God is going to protect the children like throughout his life or her life. So that's a little, a little bit of that kind of belief is attached with the dedication in our churches, sir. Okay. Uh, of course, you know, all Christian parents want God to protect their children. Um, this ceremony does not guarantee 
mm. that their child will not, you know, suffer um, tragedy or loss of any sort. But um, I, I think it's just a way of the parents affirming that they uh, want to raise their child for God. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I say like like I wanted to put some. Like exactly how he explained it, that's how we do it in our church. Exactly the same way that he, he just okay. explained it from that West. Um, okay. But what my question was is, um, like, if a parent does not want to dedicate their, their child this way, but they just wanted to do it privately at home, which pray God, you know, we dedicate this boy to you. Uh -huh. Is yeah. there any, I mean, there is no difference, right? Um, the but, yeah, th th this is not a command. Uh, no parent has to dedicate their child yeah. to the Lord um, in this way. Um, we would hope that they would want to raise their children for God. Um, that may be done, uh, there may be a ceremony in the home, there may be a ceremony in church, or there may be no ceremony. But certainly we, we would hope that in their heart that they are committing themselves to raise their children for God. Okay? Thank uh, you, sir. Th th this is not magic. You know, it's not magic. It's not a sacrament. It's just something that, that is good to do. Okay. Um, our time is up. Um, so next time we will start on the genealogy of Jesus. Uh, next time we will look uh, briefly at the book by Hutchinson and Kieran will give a report on chapter four. Um, here it is 10 minutes till midnight. So I'm gonna have to go and I'm gonna have to hit the sack. <laughs> I've been going nonstop for the last two weeks. So it'll be good. Um, oh, the Lord bless you, and uh, have a good weekend, and we will see you on Wednesday. Wednesday, your time, and uh, Tuesday, mine. And Thank we'll you. be at the, at the normal time. We'll be at 930. Okay? God bless you. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. God Bye. bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.